The Unshackled Ways, episode 183. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. One troubling development we have commented on frequently here at The Unshackled is that of corporate virtue signalling. Rather than delivering a return to their shareholders and providing satisfactory products to their customers, corporations have decided to instead become involved in social justice campaigns. This was no more apparent than during the same-sex marriage postal survey, where almost every major corporation supported the Yes campaign. Corporations supporting such campaigns is what is known as their corporate social responsibility, which in the modern business world is seen to be necessary to to give corporations a social license to operate. But in supporting such overtly political campaigns, such as same-sex marriage, corporations are creating division in our society, including in its own customer base and employees, meanwhile neglecting its core business. So how did corporations become captured by the social justice lobby, and how can this conduct be curbed to once again end the politicization of every business? Well, that's the subject of a new analysis paper released by Dr. Jeremy Samet, who is a senior research fellow at the Centre for Independent Studies in Sydney called Curbing Social Responsibility, Preventing Politicisation and Preserving Pluralism in Australian Business. His area of expertise is the health system, which he recently edited the book The Future of Medicare, and also Child Protection, where he authored the book The Madness of Australia Child Protection in 2015, both published by our friends at Conocourt Publishing. We are lucky to be joined by Jeremy today to look at this issue in depth and the, the current state of corporate social responsibility. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for having me. Now, everyone's probably heard of the term uh, corporate uh, social responsibility, but where did it first uh, come about and uh, become uh, part of uh, corporations' uh, governance? Sure. Look, um, when I started to do this report, I was like most people, and I thought it had only been a recent development that this corporate social responsibility thing had been a thing. And I guess like many people only really became, you know, really conscious of it during the same sex marriage debate when Australian companies played a really big role in uh, the same sex marriage campaign. Um, but when I actually started to look into it, I realized that it actually has a much longer history. And there are a number of factors that explain where it's come from. Now, corporate social responsibility is this idea that companies in order to have what they term a license or a social license to operate have to consider not just the traditional things that business you know cares about is responsible for which is basically maximizing shareholder value and you know ensuring that companies are well run and serve their customers well not those sort of normal business responsibilities it's this idea that com companies also have a social responsibility to consider their social impacts on a whole host of other stakeholders, i.e. non-shareholders, who don't have a direct financial interest, but who are impacted by uh, what business does, or maybe by what business doesn't do. And what I found when I started looking into it was that it really came out of the fact that after World War II, the power of corporations really increased. Um, and what also happened was that as their influence increased, there was also a whole host of social changes. We've had a hot, we've had a far more questioning society. We've had the growth of um, advocacy organisations, particularly around the environment, and all these factors have changed the sort of operating environment in which businesses uh, operate, and and that they're expected to be more transparent and consider what their impact of their activities are on the broader community. Now, I think there's a certain um, legitimacy to that in some cases, you know, and, and it can and, and doing these sort of social responsibility things can actually serve um, the, the interest of shareholders. Uh, in the case of say, like you might address the environmental impact of a business because you want to you know, either avoid a lawsuit or you want to stop government regulations that might actually be worse for the business. But what it's actually become is an illegitimate way of corporations starting to play politics with issues that have 
very limited or no connection to shareholder interests. And that's really what my report is trying to focus on and draw attention to. Because I think this needs to be a real wake up call for business that there's a real danger that their role, their, their reputations and their role is going to be politicized and that shareholders money, more importantly, is going to be spent on political activities that got very limited, if, if any, connection to shareholders interests. Yes, and over the ten, uh, past 10 years, we've seen uh, corporations move uh, to overtly uh, political uh, aspect of their corporate social responsibility. Obviously, uh, what, what motivated you to write this paper was their, their role during the, the same-sex marriage uh, postal survey, but there's also other issues uh, where uh, corporations take an overtly political uh, position, such as on the Indigenous uh, recognition, and of course the, the big banks not lending to uh, new coal uh, projects, and then of mm -hmm. course there's the uh, gender equality, uh, which uh, push, which obviously on the face of it doesn't seem like a bad thing, but uh, it gets into, and you talk about this in your paper, the, the unconscious uh, bias and working with yeah. uh, organisations such as the Diversity Council of Australia. Look, th there are a lot of different threads to where this stuff comes from, where the, where the push for CSR comes from. And in all those examples that you gave, it's a really good example of the fact that I think Part of the explanation is that left-wing advocacy and left-wing organisations are far more organised and they sort of know what they want and they know how to get it, so they lobby more effectively, um, particularly in an age when they've got social media to put pressure on companies and companies are afraid of the reputational consequences if they don't sort of, you know, toe the line and endorse the agenda of the activists. But what our paper also shows is that also why, it is, why I think it's growing in scale is because, as I said before, there is a legitimate role for corporate social responsibility. There are some things that business should do in, their, in the best interest of the business and be and act socially responsible. Uh, but what has happened is that as that has sort of been mainstreamed and introduced into what becomes known as corporate governance, which is basically the rules and framework that, you know, how companies are uh, best managed and, and, and governed at board level, um, like in all areas of business, it's um, when boards and senior managers need advice on these particular issues, they either call in specialists, so they call in consultants, or they build their own corporate team of, you know, CSR experts to deal with this stuff. And what it's really become now is this industry across uh, business, there's this whole army of CSR managers and consultants who've all got a vested interest in pushing this. So sort of they're inside the corporate tent, They've got, a, they've got all these act activists and advocacy organisations outside who are telling them what they should do. Uh, of course, there's a vested interest in wanting to say this stuff is really important because the more important it is, you know, the higher your status and the higher you can justify your pay within the, you know, in the corporate uh, totem pole. And the really concerning thing is that now these, um, what I call, they're not just CSR professionals as I like to term themselves, they're actually CSR activists. And they're saying that the next step for CSR is that uh, companies need to get involved in what they call systemic change around social, political, and environmental issues. Now, that is actually going to the next level. That's basically saying that companies need to get involved in political activism. And as you can understand in you know the way the, the culture tends to operate these days that every institution is talking about progressive so-called progressive uh, political activism. And we can really see that in the new corporate governance guidelines that have been pro proposed by the Australian Stock Exchange. And they talk not only about the, the need for companies to recognise the fundamental importance of earning a social licence, but they actually list the sort of things that they say companies need to get involved in if they're gonna earn that social licence. And it's sort of what you would expect. It's, you know, get involved in human rights, uh, tax minimisation, they even list. Uh, they also say, of course, climate change, but also things like so-called fair wages. Now, these are highly political uh, issues, politically contentious issues. And I don't think it's the appropriate role of companies to have a say on these issues because they are not directly related to shareholders' interests. So it's really about trying to limit uh, corporate social responsibility to what are the legitimate business parameters where there is a, an interest for the company and for the um, and shareholders' interest at stake, not allowing this corporate social responsibility um, 
uh, idea to become what the activists want. Now, the Centre for Independent Studies, it's a free market think tank, and defenders of these uh, corporations' activism say they're just responding to uh, market uh, for, uh, forces, that uh, uh, they're reacting to their, their consumers, uh, but uh, you, you don't believe that's uh, completely the case. Look, I think there is a certain element of truth to that because unfortunately we live in very polarised times when there is... I think a group of people who, you know, that we talk about them being sort of like value based and they do want to sort of shop with, um, you know, a particular firm or bank with somebody uh, with a particular bank that endorses, you know, their political views of the world. But it's another question whether it is actually in the best interests of companies to actually do that. What is never discussed in talking about CSR, and this is the point that my report makes, and this is because most of the discussion is usually amongst the activists who are always pushing this and never see any downsides. What they don't uh, want to admit is that uh, politicising company brands can have a downside because there is no consensus about a lot of the issues about which uh, corporate social responsibility gets involved in. And there's a real risk that not only will they politicise their brands, but by politicising their brands, they will alienate you know, customers, employees, shareholders, and other stakeholders in the communities who basically don't share the uh, progressive worldview that a lot of the CSR activists have. One of the problems here as well is that given the sort of polarised environment which we now live in, a lot of corporates, I think, sort of live in what we call the bubble, the you know the bubble of elite opinion, where you know they mix with the same people who have the same opinions about uh, certain issues, uh, and they sort of don't real what what they think is socially responsible is actually politically contentious. So, my report is trying to wake up corporate elites to to that reality, and also wake them up in the context that there is this industry, this group of activists who are pushing for companies to do more and more and will inappropriately politicise them and they need to consider what the business risks of that are, of, of that it is, and they should therefore, I argue, and remain what they should be, which is pluralistic institutions that are open to all members of the community, basically by not meddling in politics. You talk about in your report that risk management is is one of the, the goals of, of CSR, but uh, but of course probably one of the corporations that made the the biggest hash of things during the the marriage debate was uh, Telstra. They they initially supported it, but then they had a lot of contracts with the the Catholic Church saying, "Oh, we're we're stepping away from our active position," and then there was a backlash to that, and then they said yeah. we're we're, we're uh, supporting it again, and they wasted all this energy on on this issue. Uh, which, which of course, uh, uh, Telstra recently is going through uh, another uh, restructure. Yeah. yeah, I think that's an excellent example. And that's really the point that I'm making, that if you get involved in these political issues, there will be a downside because, as I say, they're political issues. Companies should, you know, focus on uh, satisfying their customers, maximising returns on uh, shareholders' investment and complying with their obligations under the law. That's what, you know, the business of business to that extent should be business. Now, as I say, there are sometimes legitimate reasons why they want to do what's known as um, corporate social responsibility, but these sort of um, playing politics has that, exactly that downside that you are that, that you are talking about, and they've sort of been shown up to be, um, in a sense, hypocrites because they've been preaching all this corporate social responsibility, but while in many cases uh, ripping off their customers, and it's sort of compounded the reputational damage that they've um, that has been incurred th thanks to the Royal Commission. So, I think this is a sort of a salutary tale that you are better off. The companies are better off, sort of as Peter Dutton said, sticking to their knitting and trying to, you know, fulfill their core business roles and not get involved in, you know, playing politics on issues in which, you know, there are a whole host of risks that simply aren't factored into it because too much of the debate around CSR has been dominated by people who are like-minded and have got a vested interest in pushing it and saying there's no problem here. 
Now, uh, with your uh, research, and obviously you've been following this issue uh, closely, and it's it's something, uh, this corporate virtue signaling, it's something that's frustrated our audience uh, throughout the, the, the past year. Uh, have you uh, come across uh, people who either uh, work for these uh, corporations or uh, just ordinary consumers who uh, basically basically it's that they've just been frustrated with it you know found that their their free speech is curtailed look i think that the gen and this is one of these things people only tend to speak about this in whispers and they don't want to go public about it because like in most things if you sort of dissent from the you know, progressive orthodoxy, you're sort of targeted. And particularly within the, within business, you can pay both a professional and a social price for these things, particularly when a lot of these uh, corporate virtue signaling, social responsibility uh, initiatives are driven out of HR departments, which of course are responsible for hiring and firing and promotion and all those issues. So there's sort of like an underground uh, culture of people who are frustrated with this, who sort of resent the um, the daily virtue signaling emails that they might get from, you know, people in culture department telling them what they should think about, you know, various issues. I guess the greatest example of that was that language guide that uh, Qantas issued uh, earlier this year talking about, you know, how you can use respectful language and, you know, not use the term mum and dad because it might offend, um, um, uh, uh, other some people who um, you know uh, either, either either gay or um, gender neutral or, or whatever the terminology is. I'm, luckily, I don't get those emails daily, so it's not <laughs> the language is on the tip of my tongue. But um, I, I think there is a, uh, a sort of an underground resentment of these issues, and it's what we would expect. You know, uh, we are not a monolithic society; we are a pluralistic society, and people resent the implication that is underpinning this, which is that if you want, want to work for a company, you have to subscribe to a political point of view. Now, I don't think there should be political tests to work in corporate Australia. It should be what you're able to contribute to the mission of the company that that, that uh, dictates it. And I think that is going to be a, a real issue that um, I think hopefully drives the uh, the addressing of this issue because, uh, as I say, companies should be open to all perspectives and they should be focused on what is their core business, not on um, these political issues that are extraneous to, to what's really in the best interest of shareholders in general. Now, despite uh, people's frustrations with this corporate virtue signaling, the other uh, corporations are still going full full steam ahead. I mean, you mentioned Qantas. That uh, guide came out uh, after the uh, same-sex marriage uh, survey, and then there was that ad uh, re uh, recently about uh, diversity. And in your report, you talk about uh, w uh, that they're wanting to put uh, CSI into law, not through the, the government, uh, federal government legislation, <laughs> but the uh, Australian Stock Exchange and yep. the Australian Institute of, of Company uh, Directors. So can you yep. um, talk about that? Yeah, that's, uh, there are these, as I mentioned before, there is uh, ASIC, the Australian Stock Exchange has got what's known as its corporate governance guidelines. And that's basically what they recommend as best practice. Um, it's been about three versions of that dating back to the early 2000s and all of those um, three versions have pushed the CSR agenda in various ways by recommending how companies can address these issues of, uh, of corporate social responsibility. That's really encouraged businesses to uh, sort of get serious, I, you would say, about CSR because it's sort of part of um, the reporting requirements that, that ASIC, ASIC dictate and companies have to say if they don't address all the criteria in these corporate governance guidelines including CSR sections they have to explain why and so to sort of avoid the embarrassment of, of saying your company's not interested in social responsibility companies tend to comply so that's helped build this industry um, that, that is very now now it's going to the next step uh, they're now talking about, you know, fundamental importance of a social license. They're saying they're actually dictating the particular political issues that companies they recommend companies should uh, get involved in to earn their social license. And this, what this really reflects, is this mindset of the activists, what I call the activists, who are saying, you know, the next step in this is for companies to take, you know, 
this this role, this political role in system wide change across social and economic issues. Now, that is going to represent a fundamental challenge to what we understand the proper role of the company is. It's going to politicise their roles. You know, so what we see now in terms of corporate virtue signalling will just be the tip of the iceberg. And it's going to, as I say, politicise them in ways that I think is going to have negative impacts on many businesses because people simply don't want, don't have the same issues that all the CSR professionals say. And uh, companies should be interested in protecting their brands and being open to all perspective uh, because, um, you know, uh, it, this is not a this is not the appropriate role for companies to play in our society basically and as you mentioned uh, you think that uh, some so, uh, corporate social responsibility is welcome obviously non-discriminatory uh, employment uh, policies i think everyone uh, agrees with yeah. that and that uh, obviously you shouldn't underpay your workers or uh, yeah. have them in in bad working uh, conditions uh, yeah. but yeah it's it's what we've seen over the the, the past 10 years this uh, from what is what you'd say basic of uh, uh, fair as the Australian Australian expression goes, a fair go to mm. going going beyond uh, to these political issues, which have just got no relation to uh, basically how you operate. Well, exactly. You know, uh, companies are uh, are required to comply with the law, and there's laws against discrimination. There's laws about pay and all those issues. But again, this is going far beyond that. This is saying basically that companies need to get involved in political activism, and that is a fundamental change to how we understand the, what the role of companies are and what their appropriate roles are. And we should also remember here that uh, going back to the original work on this topic by Milton Friedman, where he said, you know, we've got an agent and a principal problem. You know, the shareholders, this is all done in, in shareholders' names, but it's often the agents, i.e. the managers and the bureaucrats who, you know, who, who work in all these companies. And basically, let's face it, companies are, you know, private sector bureaucracies given the way that they run. Um, it's often their interests and their views that are dictating here, not the interests of shareholders. And they can basically impose all these costs of running all this CSR stuff onto shareholders. Uh, and, and, um, and, and, but, and at the same time, I think, and this is, this is the big issue that they won't address, which they won't accept that there is a downside to doing this, that people are turned off from, from corporate brands by this stuff as much as some are turned on. And my remedy for this is not to say, it's to say they should be non-political. They should only get involved in politics if the shareholders' interests are at stake around issues, particularly you know, issues like company tax or regulation or the traditional you know, economic interests of companies. This meddling in cultural politics, in particular, you know, and of course the whole diversity thing in, in, in particular, is a real problem. It's divisive. You know, people people don't don't have a you know people aren't convinced about the arguments around things like gender neutral bathrooms and all those sorts of um, issues. And that company should simply keep out of it because it's really you know none of their concern. And at the end of your report, it's not just stating the, the problem, as with all Centre for Independent Study papers, it proposes a practical solution and you've called it the community pluralism principle. Yep. Look, one of the things I've realised as I've done this work is the degree to which we have CSR because basically the people who've promoted it have built a whole institutional framework and structures, both within business and in the broader business community, like we've seen with the ASIC uh, corporate governance guidelines. What I propose with the community pluralism principle is to create a counter institutional framework that can allow corporate leaders who want to push back on this to be able to easily refer to that to justify their decision. So basically what the community pluralism principle is saying is that while yes, there is a legitimate role for companies to do CSR in the best interest of shareholders. What they need to be careful about is that those activities don't politicise their brand and don't uh, distract from the core business functions of companies. And I also make the point that they should be open to, this is what the principle states, they should be open to all perspectives so that they don't alienate any group of shareholders, employees and customers. I think it's really important that we don't just sort of um, 
but we create a framework that where corporate leaders are easily able to explain why they aren't doing what the CSR activists are pushing for. And hopefully, if we can embed this idea, the community pluralism principle, into uh, corporate governance, into the language and practice of corporate governance, it will be a lot easier for corporate leaders to say, no, getting involved in that issue is inappropriate for us because we want to remain a pluralistic organisation like we should be. And it's particularly important for companies to remain pluralistic because they have special privilege, rights and privileges that have been granted to them by the whole community through the, through the, through the Acts of Parliament and the corporate legislation that give them those rights and privileges. And they should respect that by not alienating uh, particular sections of the, of the community and also by not meddling in political issues that have nothing to do with shareholders' interests. Well, we certainly hope that there can be some change in this area. So thank you, Jeremy, for undertaking this uh, timely uh, analysis. Uh, keep up the, the, the great work and uh, in your other policy areas as well. And uh, thanks once again. My pleasure, Tim. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. As always, I'd like to remind you about some exciting upcoming events occurring around the nation. Former UKIP leader and Brexit champion Nigel Farage is almost due in Australia, and he's visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane, as well as Auckland. Tickets are still on sale and can be booked by going to nigellive.com.au. Also coming by year's end is the tour in Australia by internet television personality and founder of the Proud Boys, Gavin McGuinness. He is being hosted by Penthouse Australia. You can book your place by going to gavinlive.com.au. Also, uh, another reminder that we can't bring you uh, all of this uh, news and other productions without your support. So please consider becoming a patron of The Unshackled by going to patreon.com slash The Unshackled. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.